August of 2005, I had the opportunity to go to the Gulf Coast after Katrina, Hurricane Katrina hit. I've shared quite a bit about that with you before, but there's one part of that that I've not shared as it relates to a particular individual in my church there. Uh, I went with a few other pastors the next morning, and when we got to Biloxi and Christian Pass, we were not able to go to very much of the area because they were just beginning their search and rescue. A lot of the streets and the highways were closed from debris. Uh, houses were relocated a mile inland, uh, for example. Cars everywhere, boats everywhere, and all the rest. I noticed that as we drove by uh, a particular neighborhood, uh, there were a few houses that were still left standing, and they would have an X on the house. And on the, uh, in the quadrants, they would have either a number or a symbol. One of those numbers would indicate how many had died in the house. The number could be one. The number could be six uh, that had died because uh, just a few hours before we had arrived earlier the, next, the day before. But uh, that evening, I got back. It was overwhelming. Every sense of my being was affected. Uh, what I saw, what I heard. It's really what I didn't hear. It's what uh, I touched, what I smelled. Uh, I'll never forget it. Still, it, it really is overwhelming. But about a week later, a man in my church by the name of Jay came in to see me. He was a highway patrolman. And he said, uh, Mark, uh, they asked me to go and help with the search and rescue. And a helicopter took me over a certain neighborhood. No one could get in by vehicle, so they dropped me in the neighborhood, and I was to go house by house. And he said, uh, I'm, I'm struggling, he said, because I was the first guy in the house, and I could see how people were doing everything they possibly could to keep their head above the waterline. He said, I found people in places in homes where you would never find an individual. They did everything they could, stacking furniture or whatever else, to get above a waterline so they wouldn't die. It was devastating, and he said, I'm, I'm struggling. So we talked about that. There's a spiritual hurricane that has been devastating this planet ever since Adam and Eve. It's the hurricane of sin. Man has been trying to keep his head above water. As those individuals in 2005 were wanting somebody to deliver them, to rescue them from a pending death, so there are those today, who, though they don't even realize why they're in the condition that they're in, they've tried to rescue themselves. They've done everything they know to do, but it wasn't enough. Well, there's good news today. Paul told a young pastor named Timothy these words, one sentence that I want to share with you today. This is a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, out of that verse, I want to show you three reasons why Christ has delivered us from our sin. Last Sunday, we talked about how he delivered us from our lostness. Today, he has delivered us from sin. I want you to notice, first of all, a remarkable salvation. A remarkable salvation. He says that it is a salvation for sinners. Now, it's a salvation from poverty, from war, from sickness, from disease, from ignorance, from a horrible government, or whatever else. And many th people think that these are the things in which we need to be saved from. But as we get older, we realize that there's something different. We realize that we need to be delivered from those things, but there's something behind all those things from which we need to be delivered. And the Bible calls that sin. Now, what is sin? Well, in the New Testament, the word sin was an archery term. It meant that an archer had pulled his bow back, he let the arrow fly, and the arrow sinned. The arrow missed the bullseye, missed the mark. And spiritually, Paul is saying that sin is missing the mark of God's perfection, God's holiness. And whenever we miss that mark, we have sinned against God. 
But I want you to think of sin in a little bit different way today, in different terms. Because sin is not so much the committing of an evil act, but it is refusing something that is godly. Before the cross, we would understand sin as the breaking of God's law. But since the cross, we understand now that sin is not only that, but it's also the refusal of God. It's the refusal to hear His voice that is calling us and that is pulling us up to the higher things that are in Christ. Yes, we understand the committing of sinful acts, but it's those sins that we commit so often now as believers where God has called us to do something. He's asking us to follow Him in a certain way, but we have refused that voice. Rather than refusing Him, we need to be responding to Him. That we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit and responding to God speaking to us. Another way this plays itself out is the refusal of others. That there are many opportunities in a given day where God is asking us to join Him in what He is doing. And often that asking, that voice comes through the voice of someone else. Someone who is in need. Someone who is hurting. And we, we, we dismiss that. We ignore that. We don't want to get into the mess of it. Uh, I had a, a long conversation with a pastor one time about a particular issue that was with a, a particular family, but it represented an overarching issue. And he said, I just don't want to get into the mess of it. And I said, well, that doesn't solve the problem. I mean, sometimes life gets messy. And sometimes it's in the mess of life that we hear the voice of God. It's in the problems of life, the hurt of life, the wound of life, that it is a voice that's coming from somebody else, and God is asking us to join him, but we refuse God. We're sinning against God by refusing to respond to what God is saying to us. And in reality, we have refused Christ himself. Is that not what Jesus said in Matthew 25? Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. We're living in a disillusioned age. Our nation and the world are in a state of social, moral, and political upheaval. Society has been shaken to its foundation. You know, you think about what's happened this past year. And the two primary events that have affected our nation is the COVID pandemic and the election that we've just gone through. Now, I don't care what side of the spectrum that you're on politically or how you feel about the pandemic and how everybody ought to be responding to the pandemic. One thing is for sure, it has shaken our nation to its foundation, to its core. It's, it's made us think about things we have not thought about. I shared last night, I'll share it again tonight, that it, it's caused us to deal with things that have not been exposed. COVID uh, primarily has exposed some things, fears, anxieties that we might have that we didn't think was there, insecurities, where we're placing our hope, where our trust is, where our security is. Those things have been stripped away, and now we've been left with ourselves trying to figure this out. And we come to a point where we realize that, is my foundation secure? Do I know that I'm going to be all right? But behind all of it is sin. Man's waiting for somebody who can deliver him. Uh, nations are wanting to be delivered from corruption. And the world is waiting to be delivered from destruction. You know, it's tragic and really pathetic that people will deny that they believe that. But down deep inside, they're desperate. And it's true. One newspaper editorial said, The materialism born of the Industrial Revolution, and which has found its apogee in the terrible conception of the totalitarian state, has brought neither inward peace nor outward security. Never did we more need the Christian message of a Savior. 
So we have a remarkable salvation. It's for sinners. But secondly, we have a remarkable Savior. There's a great need for a Savior to save sinners. But here's the problem. Sinners are bad. Sinners are rebellious. Sinners are undeserving. In a moral sense, sin is leprosy. In a legal sense, sin is treason. What is more that millions of people, they don't even want to be saved as long as they can enjoy the short-lived season of sin. As long as I can do that, then, then maybe later on I'll think about it, but they want their time and their space to live their own life, have no desire to understand their need to be saved. Sinners not only need forgiveness for their sin, but they need to be delivered from the real core problem, and that is innate sin, sin that is inherited by a sinful nature. Sinners need to be saved here, but they also need to be saved in the hereafter, as we learned last week. Sinners need to be saved from judgment and the horror of hell. But who can do all that for us? Well, Paul answers that. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. He came into the world. The word Christ points us back to the Old Testament, that being the Messiah, the anointed one. Micah 5.2 says his origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Isaiah writes, he is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. Even the Samaritans in John chapter 4 said that he is the savior of the world. Now the name Jesus is the Old Testament equivalent to Joshua, which means savior. He could have been given a more impressive name, but... The angel said to Mary and then to Joseph that he would be called Jesus. Now, why is that? Well, Jesus was a very common name. It was a name that God gave him so that he could identify with ordinary man. You know, in, in America, it's very rare that you would ever meet somebody who's named Jesus. You know, we would see that as offensive, especially in the Christian community. But in Latin America, Jesus is a very, very common name. They understand what was taking place in the New Testament. It's a very common name. And, but it was a name that was given so that Jesus could come and identify with us. We could see his humanity. But notice the word came. Jesus came into the world. He was not merely born. He came. That means he came into our existence. He came into our world. He came from a pre-existent life. You see, he wasn't born, and all of a sudden now he's here, but he came from somewhere to here. His birth in Bethlehem was not where he originated. Before he was named the son of Mary, he was already the son of God. Before the world had its beginning, he always was. The God of ages came from heaven to dwell with us. But notice the text is even more specific. It says Christ Jesus came into the world. He knowingly, voluntarily, compassionately came to sinners, to those who would ridicule him, those who would reject him, and those who would crucify him. He came into our world to live our life, to feel our pain, to show us the love of God, to bear our sin, and to make atonement for us all. He is still Jesus, and he still saves people from their sins. What a remarkable salvation, a remarkable Savior, but also a remarkable message. You see, the question is, is all this true? And by faith, we say, yes, it is true. Paul said it this way, this is a trustworthy statement. That means it is faithful, it is accurate, it is true. It's one of the five trustworthy statements that Paul made to the, in the pastoral epistles. And uh, the early church repeated these sayings often. They were important uh, and were the seedbed for a lot of the doctrine that we hold to today. 
but it was embedded deep within the Christian community. These are statements that they believed strongly, deep conviction. And therefore, because it is a trustworthy statement, it was deserving of full acceptance. Even 40 years between the time of the death of Christ and when this statement was written, that everybody assumed and believed that it was true. It had become a tested conviction after years of ridicule, persecution, and even martyrdom. It was then and is still today deserving of full acceptance. In 1934, the, uh, the Prince of England, Prince Edward, wanted to visit a hospital for veterans. This was a small hospital. There were only 36 veterans there from World War I. Now, these men would never leave this hospital. They would spend the rest of their lives here. These were men who uh, were injured in the war. Uh, there was no one who would be able to take care of them. They didn't have then what we have today, the services, the technology, and all the rest. So they were there, and they were being cared for by the staff. He came to the hospital, and it was, uh, it was an event. Uh, it was reported in the National Magazine when this happened. But he came to the hospital, and there were 36 men. So a nurse came and took him to each of the men. And he met them, shook their hands, spent some time with them. And then they made their way to the front door. But the Prince, uh, Prince Edward said to the nurse, wait, that was 29. There are 36 who were here. Where are the other seven? And she said, well, you really don't want to see them. These are men who are disfigured. And, and, and you don't want to go into those rooms. He said, no, I, I want to see them. So he went into their rooms and he shook the hand of each of those veterans. And then he stepped out in the hallway and the nurse was heading to the front door. And he said, wait, that was six. There's one more. And she said, please don't ask me to take you into that room. This was a man who was blind, who was dismembered, who was somebody that was unrecognizable and he said no I, I want to see him so he went into the room and he stood over this man who was stretched out still alive his face turned ashen white he drew his lips in and tears rolled down his cheeks impulsively lovingly without hesitation he leaned over and he kissed the cheek of that broken hero. The Prince of Heaven stooped far lower and kissed something that was far uglier. Not a disfigured, broken hero, but the ugliness, the evil ugliness of sinners. Listen, there has never been a story like it. There's never been a story like it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To save you and to save me. That is deserving of full acceptance. To refuse that is the most undeserving thing that we could ever do and today you could experience the compassionate grace of God because Jesus Christ came to you he came to deliver us from our sin would you bow your head and close your eyes there might be somebody here this morning who would say pastor I've come to understand that I am a sinner, that I need my sin forgiven. I, I've tried to deliver myself, to rescue myself from the effects of sin in my own life, or maybe because I'm a victim of sinful circumstances that I could not control. But I need to be delivered. I need to be rescued today. And it's all because of the love of Christ. It's all because of Christmas. Christmas is about a God who delivered you. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to believe that this is a trustworthy saying. 
It deserves full acceptance. Not intellectual acceptance. Not just moral acceptance. But with every fiber of my being that I fully yield my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the least that I can do because of what he's done for me. Now you may not be sure how to do that, how to make that happen. But when we sing this next song, as an act of worship, responding to God's voice, not, respond, not refusing it, but responding to it, you come and we'll help you as you experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. There might be others in this room who know the Lord, but for whatever reason, you're not where you should be spiritually. Maybe you're really discouraged right now by the circumstances of life. Well, the Lord understands your pain. He understands all that's going on in the issue that you're dealing with. And He loves you. And He's empowered you to get through this. And that He he wants you to let Him help you get through it. And it's by giving it to Him, by surrendering it to Him. And maybe that's what God is saying to you this morning. Don't refuse the voice. Respond to that voice of surrendering it all to Him. There might be others God is leading you to become part of our church family. We really would love to have you a part of of God's family, God's church. And if he's speaking to you about that, then we invite you to come today as well. There may be others who need to come and kneel quietly and pray or have somebody pray for you. Maybe God is speaking to someone here today about serving the Lord in full-time vocational ministry. Maybe you, you, you have questions about that. We want to help you. Father, I thank you that when you saw us in our disfigured, sinful state, you didn't turn your back on us. You didn't walk away. You didn't mock us. You stooped out of heaven and came to us. And you kissed us with your grace and your love. As ugly as we are. Father, that deserves our life. Fully surrendered to you. May you help these with the commitments they need to make today. Right now. In Jesus' name, amen.